So um, I've been a registered dietitian since 1990, which tells you that I'm pretty ancient. And what got me into nutrition was my love of sport. I was a distance runner and an alpine ski racer, and I knew that what I ate had to have some effect on my athletic performance, but I really didn't know what that was when I was in high school, and so I decided to study nutrition in college. And um, so sports nutrition is really my first love, even though in my nutrition um, career I work with people with all different kinds of nutrition issues, whether it's people who need to gain or lose weight, people who have heart disease or diabetes or food allergies or intolerances. Um, but sports nutrition is really my first love, so um, thank you all for giving me a chance to spout off about that tonight. Um, I'll start off the talk with a picture of Leo, and I know that you're going to say, what does Leo have to do with sports nutrition? Well, Leo has absolutely nothing to do with sports nutrition, but he's really, really cute, and he's my new puppy, and it starts my talk off with everybody smiling, so that's <laughs> probably some good start. Um, let's talk about how we build our best sports diet. Um, well, sports performance in general. Actually, um, we consider a few different things. We think about proper training, first of all. Periodization of training, in other words, really having a plan for building up to the, the pinnacle of the race or the game or the end of the season, that sort of thing. So part of our, our great sports performance is how we train. That means not overtraining or undertraining, getting plenty of rest, um, and training hard when we need it. Obviously, the, the, the best sports diet is a big part of our um, best performance, and we're going to talk about that tonight. But adequate sleep and rest is also really important. So at the end of my talk, we'll talk a little bit about ergogenic aids or um, little tips and, and tricks that people look for to get um, the, the edge. But basically, it always comes back to these three things. Proper training, proper diet, and adequate rest are really proven to improve our athletic performance. So what does our best sports diet look like? It's individualized, so it's going to look a little different for every person. But um, we want to consider our long-term health first and foremost. So as a dietitian, I'm always thinking, yes, we want to get you the best athletic performance, but if you're um, a young athlete, you're not really thinking about avoiding heart disease 50 years down the road, but I am. And so my sports diet for you is going to be a diet that promotes health and longevity for years to come while giving you a really good um, sports um, advantage. The diet's going to be made up of mostly whole, unprocessed foods. So I brought some examples tonight, and you can see that there's very little on that table that comes out of a box or a bag, and most of it is just whole foods in their natural state. That's really what we want to focus on is trying to avoid as many processed foods as possible and, and keeping our diet whole and with foods in their natural state. We want to include a lot of variety in our diet, right? We tend to get stuck in a rut of eating the same foods over and over again. But the more variety we can get in the diet, the better nutrition profile we have. The more variety of vitamins, minerals, um, carbohydrate, protein, fats that we can get so we know that we're really meeting all of our nutrition needs. We want our diet to be age appropriate. So if we're still growing and we need to meet those energy needs and protein needs for growth, we need to consider that. Um, if, we, if we are doing a strength um, sport versus an endurance sport, we need to consider that as well when we consider how much should be from carbohydrate, how much from protein, how many calories do I need? Do I want to lose weight or gain weight? Um, is my sport a sport that is a, a fast, intense sport, or is it more a long, um, slower duration kind of sport, like someone who spends three days in a canoe race paddling all day long? 
versus someone who's running a 100 meter sprint. So we have different nutrition needs based on our sport as well. Tonight I'm going to talk about um, healthy diets and, and great sports diets. If you get the idea to make some changes in your diet, I recommend that you do that at a time when you're not competing. Um, definitely don't say, okay, I have a race tomorrow, I have a game tomorrow, so I'm going to try making this change that Amy recommended. Because sometimes introducing new foods or different nutrient compositions doesn't really agree with your body that well, and you don't want to find that out on a, a competition day. So work on this stuff on the off season or during the, the training season so that you can kind of see what your body likes and doesn't like. This is a graphic that I use a lot to talk about what does a healthy diet look like. It's the Mediterranean eating style. You've probably seen this Mediterranean pyramid before. And you can notice that the base of this pyramid, which takes up the, the greatest amount of space in your diet, is all plant foods. It's grains, specifically whole grains as much as possible, and fruits and vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, um, and some olive oil thrown in there as well. Olive oil is a great uh, monounsaturated fat, so we want to use that for most of our oil intake. How many people get at least three servings a week of beans? Garbanzo beans or hummus or black beans, kidney beans, red beans. Do you like beans? Great. Beans are a great sports food. <laughs> She's being non-committal. Non <laughs> um, beans have a lot of uh, carbohydrate, protein, healthy fiber to promote that lifelong um, health. They also have tons of vitamins, minerals, some iron. Um, they're just a really great nutrition profile. So. I always try to get people to start incorporating some beans into their diet. If you're not used to eating beans, you want to do that gradually so that your body can get used to digesting beans. But that's another great uh, food that has carbohydrate plus protein. And we're going to get into that a little bit later about how we want to add a little bit of protein to our carbohydrate. Um, I brought a, a whole bunch of different fruits and vegetables. Whatever kind of fruits are in season and, and you like are a great choice for fruits or for vegetables. They're all really good. Whole grains, we want to try to avoid the, the processed white flour. So white breads, white um, bagels, white um, cereals, that sort of thing. Trying to stick with the whole grains. This happens to be oats, but it could be barley, it could be quinoa, it could be farro, any of those whole grains. Whenever we can get those, that really is what we want to build our diet with. There is one time that we want to use more processed grains, and we're going to talk about that as far as um, right around competition or, or event timing. But for the most part, we really want to use whole grains rather than refined grains. So the next section of the pyramid you can see is um, fish. Everybody likes fish, right? No, maybe not. Um, that's okay. But fish is a great source for protein and also omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids help to reduce inflammation in the body. So not only do they help reduce the risk of heart disease, um, and reduce inflammation in diseases like diabetes. But when we think about our bodies as um, sports machines, there's a lot of inflammation. We're, we're working our bodies hard, there's a lot of breakdown, inflammation, and, and so those omega-3 fatty acids are one thing that helps. If you don't like fish or you don't eat fish, there are other sources like nuts and flax seeds and chia seeds. Um, also give us omega-3 fatty acids, so we can try to incorporate more of that in the diet as well. The next section up is um, poultry, eggs, cheese, and yogurt, so that's another great protein source, as well as that dairy area gives us a lot of calcium. So for young athletes, 
from the time that you hit puberty until you're in your early 20s, like maybe around 21-ish, is a really critical window for calcium. Uh, we want to really pack a lot of calcium into the bones because that's where you're going to reach your, your peak bone density. And it's not something that a lot of teenagers really think about. I want to build my bones as big as I can. But you'll think about it when you're 60, 70, and 80 years old, and you'll thank yourself for getting plenty of calcium in your diet so that you have really strong bones, which also come from the type of sports that you do. Impact sports also build bone density. So the combination of those two things is, is going to be a great benefit to you. The next section is the meats and sweets area. That just means that we want um, to include less red meat in the diet for health reasons. But I caution people, as long as you are a meat eater, to um, not avoid red meat completely. Red meat has a lot of good stuff in it. So if you do eat meat, try to include some red meat in your diet, especially grass-fed red meat um, or beef, which has a higher omega-3 fatty acid content. So um, another, another great thing about red meat is it has a high iron content, so it's good for athletes who need more iron. But um, sometimes people think about creatine as an ergogenic aid, and, and should I take creatine? Well, you can actually get a natural form of creatine by eating more red meat. So um, that's another great benefit to red meat. The sweets don't really benefit us in our sports diet, except for right during our event, right before and during our um, athletic event, whether it's a game or a race or a practice. That's when we really want to get a simple carbohydrate, more of the sweet kind of things that you think about. Um, and I also brought some recipes, so if you like a sweet treat of ice cream, I brought a recipe for banana peanut butter chocolate ice cream that you must try. It's super easy and delicious, and it's made from whole foods, and it includes my favorite food in it as well. So that is how we're going to build our, our general diet. You'll notice to drink, um, you guys aren't going to be drinking too much wine, I'm sure, but water is the beverage of choice. Water is what we really need as athletes, and we should be continuously hydrating throughout the day. We're going to get to that a little bit more soon. So the first thing to consider is how much energy do we need? So we want to meet our energy needs based on is our body growing or not? And how much energy am I expending during the day through my regular activities and also through my sport and my training? Um, so we want to support growth. We want to consider do I need to gain or lose weight? That changes our energy needs as well. And that's, again, something that we want to work on in the preseason or off-season, that, that weight change if we can. Um, how many calories do I need is a common question, and it's sort of the million dollar question because it's a very individualized answer, and um, I have formulas that I use with my clients to try and estimate that answer, but it's um, not easy to estimate. So I try to help people if they find that they're not getting enough energy or they're losing weight and they don't want to be, then I show them how to increase calories in their diet and, and vice versa. So when I was thinking about putting together a talk, I thought, well, how about if I talk about what's new in sports nutrition? And as I started to put that together, it just kept coming back to what's not new in sports nutrition, because our bodies are still working the same way that they did 10 years ago. So even though there's lots of new research in different areas, we still have the same nutrient needs that we've always had. Carbohydrate is the body's preferred um, their personal trainer or their friends or their coach has told them that they need to eat a high protein diet. So they're on a high protein diet, which means that's at the expense of carbohydrates. They tend to be on a lower carbohydrate diet. And what I do is try and help people to see how it's really carbohydrate that your body wants to use for energy. So we want to build more of these um, high carbohydrate foods into the diet. 
foods like whole grains and um, pastas and beans and um, starchy vegetables are good sources of carbohydrate. Fruits are 100% carbohydrate. Um, dairy products are a great source of carbohydrate too. So we want to um, build plenty of that into our diet. When we look at where does our body get carbohydrate from during an event or during training or during a game, we store carbohydrate in our muscles in the form of glycogen. So our body takes all these little glucose molecules and packs them together and, and stores them in our muscles as glycogen. But as you can imagine, we only have so much muscle mass on our bodies, so we only have so much storage capacity. So in our muscles, we're storing about 300 to 400 grams of carbohydrate. That's the, the maximum capacity. What is three to 400 grams of carbohydrate? This bagel here is about 60 grams of carbohydrate, just to use that as a comparison. In our liver, we also store carbohydrate. We store um, glycogen in the liver. We can store about 75 to 100 grams because our liver is only so big as well. Um, and just floating around in our blood at all times, we have glucose floating around in our blood that's feeding our brain and that's feeding our muscles um, constantly. So we have a little bit of, of carbohydrate in, in our blood all the time. So that's all we've got to tap into when we start running or when we start playing. So where do we get our carbohydrates from? We talked a little bit about that. Um, fruits and fruit juices, grains, dairy products, vegetables, especially the starchy vegetables. And then also we get carbohydrates from sugary foods. And that those sugary foods come into play right before, during, and after our event. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So the sugary foods don't really play a role in our regular day-to-day -day diet. How much carbohydrate do we need? If we look at different intensity levels, that gives you an idea of how many grams per day of carbohydrate our bodies need. So when I did the calculations for total carbohydrates per day, I used my own body at 130 pounds to give you an estimate of what that looks like. So for very light training, in the middle of that range is about 238 grams of carbohydrate. If you look at popular diets that are out there, 238 grams of carbohydrate you would think would kill you because it's just so much carbohydrate. And people are feeling like they should be on these diets that have less than 50 grams of carbohydrate in them. But that's actually a really moderate, pretty low amount of carbohydrate if you're just doing skills training and really not expending a whole lot of energy. As you get into higher intensity, you can see all the way down to um, moderate to high intensity if you're training four and five hours a day, and that happens, right, in preseason. You might have two, three different practices in the day. Um, you can see that your body's using a whole lot of energy and a lot of carbohydrate. So I give you a sample menu for that lower end, a total of 257 grams of carbohydrate, and I used um, a high school student as an example when I said, what did you have to eat today? And so this is what she told me. Um, and I added it up, and this actually only gives you about the, the base level of needed carbohydrates. So if we're training hard, we really need to add a whole lot of food and a specifically high carbohydrate food to that day. So we talk about what to eat before exercise, what to eat during exercise, and what to eat after exercise. Before exercise, if we consume food with carbohydrate um, in the four hours before exercise, what we're doing is we're building up the carbohydrate that's stored in our liver and muscles so that we have the maximum available, especially if it's a morning workout. A lot of athletes will get up in the morning and just start training without eating. But our liver has used up a lot of its carbohydrate stores overnight to try and maintain our glucose levels. So we really need to get some fuel in in the morning before we start training. Um, 
and, and also from the muscles. We're going to talk about how to really pack the muscles full of carbohydrate after your event, after your training, after your game, so that you're ready for tomorrow's workout. But also eating carbohydrate before a, a, an event will stave off hunger and also to give us a, a bit of a psychological boost of feeling really fueled and ready to go. Some athletes have nervous stomach and it's really hard to eat solid food and get those carbohydrates that we need. So that's where um, we can use some um, liquid types of carbohydrates. And I listed some examples at the bottom there of different um, liquid carbohydrate um, sources. Also, it's helpful for things like running a half marathon or a marathon where you're not going to be eating a bagel in the middle of the race. During the exercise, if our event is lasting us less than an hour, we don't really need to consider fueling with carbohydrate during the event. We just want to fuel up after we get done with the practice or the game. So if it's less than an hour, really just water is what we're thinking about for staying hydrated during the event. But if it's more than an hour, we really need to provide a readily available carbohydrate source because our um, liver and our muscles will run out of carbohydrate and we just don't have enough to sustain us more than about an hour. So we're going to start taking in carbohydrate at the beginning of our event if we know that it's going to last more than an hour. We don't start taking it in after an hour, after we've used up all our carbohydrate. We know it's going to last longer than an hour, so we start taking in some carbohydrate right from the very beginning. And carbohydrate during, the, during exercise can also have an effect on the central nervous system, especially in the brain, the amygdala, which is the reward center. And so that can give us the, the motivation and the boost and the energy to work harder and run faster. It's also great for high intensity sports that are stop and start because we're burning a lot of carbohydrate when we're at a higher intensity. The higher the intensity of our sport, the more carbohydrate we're burning and less fat we're burning for fuel. The lower intensity our sport, the more fat we can burn and the less carbohydrate we need. So any of those really high intensity sports like soccer and field hockey and lacrosse, um, it's important to include some carbohydrate during the event. What would you recommend for what, it, what it would be the go-to snack for halftime or whatever during the event for the kids? Um, it's somewhat individualized based on what someone can tolerate. I think that during the event, if kids are going to be playing for more than an hour, then sports drinks can be really useful. And a lot of people shun sports drinks saying, oh, it's just sugar. Well, yeah, that's the whole point. We want sugar at that, at that moment. And kids tend to drink more. I think we all tend to drink more if it tastes good. We tend to drink more than we would just water. So I think that sports drinks like Gatorade are a good option in that case because it's giving us that readily available carbohydrate source plus the hydration that we need. So we're probably going to get better hydration and the carbohydrate that we need. For snacks in between, it really just depends on what kids can tolerate. It might be some fruit or it might be um, a half a bagel or some um, pretzels or you know, whatever high carbohydrate food can be tolerated and still be able to play. So I think the easiest thing to include during an event is liquid carbohydrate. So how much carbohydrate um, do we want to include during an event? Say we're playing a game or say we're running a half marathon. This kind of gives us a bit of a um, formula to use. The maximum amount that we can use is about one gram of carbohydrate per minute. So we kind of look at how long the event is lasting and add up how much carbohydrate we want to include during the event. And things like sports drinks or shop blocks or other carbohydrate um, 
supplements will come with a label that tell you exactly how much carbohydrate is in a serving size. So the benefit to using a sports drink is that they were formulated specifically for sports. Back in the late 1980s, 1990s, Michael Jordan wanted us all to believe that Gatorade was a product that should be used every day and kids on the playground needed Gatorade as their go-to drink. But actually, Gatorade was developed um, several years ago in Florida by um, football players training in the hot Florida heat who really needed something more than water because they were losing too many electrolytes in all the sweat they were producing. So scientists got together and gave the Florida Gators their perfect sports nutrition supplement, which was Gatorade. It includes the perfect amount of carbohydrate in the right type of carbohydrate, in the right um, uh, density in that product so that we have the right amount of water to, um, to carbohydrate, that we get the best absorption rate so when we drink something like this, it's absorbed faster than when we drink just water or if we were to drink fruit juice or something like that. So optimally, if, we're, um, if we have an event that lasts at least an hour and a half to two hours, we're going to try and consume about 30 to 60 grams per hour in that exercise. And two and a half to three hours, about 80 to 90 per hour. If it's less than 45 minutes, we really don't need to do anything other than water. But if we're going about 45 to 75 minutes, we might want to include a little bit of sports drink or other high carbohydrate food to help give us a boost. This just gives you an idea of different um, sports nutrition supplements that and, and what their carbohydrate amounts are. After exercise, we're tired and we want to go home and lay down, right? But this is the most important time to fuel your body because this is when your muscles are depleted and your liver is depleted of carbohydrate. Your energy is all used up. This is the most critical time to replenish those resources. So if you want tomorrow's workout to feel really good, focus on after today's workout and really replenish the carbohydrate that you just used all up. We want to do that as quickly as we can because that first 24 hour period of recovery is um, critical, but you probably are exercising again within that 24 hour period. So if you can get in something within 30 to 60 minutes right after your workout or game, um, that's gonna give you the best the best absorption of carbohydrate into the muscles and the liver. So in that first four hours, we want to try and take in one, a little bit more than one grams per kilo of body weight per hour. So someone my size, say about 60 kilos. We want to consume small amounts of carbohydrate over a period of time so that we can just digest that gradually and gradually build up the carbohydrate that we've used up. We want to choose medium to high glycemic index foods, not because it's really been proven that those will um, give us better glycogen stores, but they're easy to digest, they're rapidly broken down. Things like um, more processed grains or um, pasta is a great um, source for that. We want to add some um, protein to that feeding as well, that, that meal or snack that we're taking in, because adding a small amount of protein to that carbohydrate seems to increase the um, rate of muscle rebuilding, muscle repair, and the amount of carbohydrate that we can store is actually greater when we add a little bit of protein. So I'm guessing you've all heard that chocolate milk is the perfect sports nutrition food. This is why, because chocolate milk has plenty of carbohydrate in it, but it has this same 
ratio. Are y'all good with chocolate milk? No, okay. Not everybody's good with chocolate milk. It has a lot of carbohydrate, but it also has protein in it. So um, it's gonna give us that ratio of carbohydrate and protein to help rebuild muscles and to pack carbohydrate into the, um, into the muscles and the liver. It also has the side benefits of being a great source of potassium, one of those electrolytes that we lose during exercise. It has some natural sodium in it, another electrolyte. It has um, phosphorus to help build bone density. Fruits and fruit juices and sodas you would think might be a good choice for refueling, but they're actually not as good as things with just sugar added. So the chocolate milk has just regular table sugar or sucrose, and um, the second ingredient is sugar. So that actually seems to be better for restoring muscle glycogen than fructose from fruit or sodas. So the next nutrient that we think about is protein. So we definitely need protein in our diets for muscle repair and muscle building, but we only use about um, we, it, we only use about two to four percent um, of our total energy needs as protein while we're exercising. So how much protein again? Um, Again, it depends on what our sport is, what type of training we're doing, but that kind of gives you an estimate. I don't need you to memorize all these numbers, but if you are interested in the numbers, numbers, you can certainly leave me your email and I'll gladly send you the slides. And then fat. Fat is a great calorie source. It gives us energy and gives us sustained energy. So on a day when you have um, we used to call it long, slow days of long, slow runs where you really were running for a long time period, but not real fast, not real intense bursts. We're using more fat for our energy sources. Fat also can be really healthy for our hearts if we choose the monounsaturated healthy fats, things like avocados and olive oil, nuts and seeds. The omega-3 fatty acids, we talked about that. There's no research that shows they actually enhance athletic performance, but they do work as an um, inflammation reducer, an anti-inflammatory um, nutrient. So there is some research that shows that they're beneficial for athletes with asthma, but other than that, not really a performance enhancer, but a very healthy food for our bodies. Let's talk about water. That's really the most important nutrient and the one that a lot of us are deficient in. Water, you can see, has a whole lot of jobs. It's really, really critical in the body. So it, it cools us, it carries nutrients, it cushions joints, it um, helps our kidneys to work properly. It's just really important. And when we start to become dehydrated, even just 1% of our total body weight can be a significant performance deterrent. I had a friend years ago who was a nutritionist for the U.S. women's gymnastics team, and he said that if one of his athletes came off the floor and just grabbed for the water bottle and said, I'm so thirsty, he would say to them, you're done with practice for the day, because you can imagine in gymnastics you have to be really on um, to avoid critical injuries. And if someone is that thirsty, they're probably significantly dehydrated and really at much greater risk for injury. So we, we want to try and stay hydrated ahead of the curve and be hydrated going into our performance rather than trying to make up the hydration afterwards. So we don't want to wait till we get really thirsty in order to drink. We want to be drinking plenty before that happens. How much water do we need? That's another million dollar question. So we can look at the, the dietary reference intake, which the USDA comes out with, but that's not terribly helpful. It's, it really just gives us an idea of how much normal, normal activity type people need. It doesn't really give us an athlete's perspective. 
But it depends on how hot it is and how humid it is and how much we personally sweat and how big we are and what our, our surface area is. So it's a very individualized call. And we need to remember that food also provides fluid. So things like fruits, um, these cherries here have a lot of water in them. So fruits are another great source of hydration for us, fruits and vegetables. For any athletes who are exercising in the heat or exercising for a long duration, I always recommend that you do pre and post exercise weighing. That helps you to see how much water you're losing during your exercise. Um, you can look at the color and concentration of your urine. Is it really dark or is it light lemonade um, color? We're looking for a lighter color, not a, a dark orange color. That means that we're better hydrated if our urine looks lighter. And how much? Can you go um, six or seven hours during the day without having to visit the bathroom? You probably are dehydrated. So once again, we want to experiment with fluid and electrolyte replacement during training, not on race day. I recently had an athlete who was training for the Covered Bridges Marathon. And she was following a fairly high protein, fairly moderate, somewhat low carbohydrate diet. And she was having hydration challenges, not being able to carry enough um, fluid with her during her training runs and thinking about, well, what about, what, how am I going to stay hydrated enough during this race because it's such a long race? How can I carry enough fluid? Because she found that for her, stopping at the water stops really break, broke her whole rhythm and she didn't, she didn't want to make stops, she wanted to carry all her fluid. So I showed her that when you store carbohydrate in your muscles and your liver, you also store, for every gram of carbohydrate, you store two grams of water. So just by increasing the carbohydrate in her diet, she already um, was finding that she was better hydrated and going through less water bottles and less Gatorade during her training runs and during the race. So um, it all kind of fits together. So these are the pills and potions that a lot of athletes look to to try and get the competitive edge. And when we do that, I think it's really important to remember that, that supplements are not regulated by the FDA. If you take a medication, the FDA oversees all of those medications and their safety. But any kind of nutritional supplement is not covered under the FDA's um, um, watchful eye. It's not regulated by the FDA. So any manufacturer can put out any type of nutritional supplement and throw any label on it. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to contain what is, is said on the label. So you ask yourself, is this safe? Is it effective? Could it be contaminated? Is it, or is it from a reputable company that's probably a pure supplement? And also, if you're competing at an NCAA level, you need to say, is this illegal? Um, aid. One of the most common ergogenic aids is caffeine, and the research shows that caffeine actually can en enhance endurance performance, so runners and cyclists especially, I find, like to use some caffeine. Um, there's also some evidence that shows it can help in high-intensity activities, and those studies found that about two to three milligrams per kilo of body weight was effective. Higher doses than that were not effective. It acts as a central nervous system, so it masks fatigue and allows us to keep going at a higher level of intensity. When should we um, drink that cup of coffee? We're not really sure. There's not any good evidence about how soon before the workout we should drink that cup of coffee. So um, this just gives you an idea of how much um, caffeine is in different products. I caution all athletes to avoid caffeine tablets. There is nothing safe about caffeine tablets. And um, I think that if you want to get your caffeine from a, a cup of coffee, then that's probably safe and probably fine to do. But never um, the caffeine containing um, pills and definitely not the, um, the caffeine shots or, or energy drinks. I would, 
and we'd stay away from those. There are some adverse side effects of increased heart rate and blood pressure. Um, caffeine acts as a bowel stimulant, so um, another reason not to try, well, I think I'm going to try that caffeine before my race. <laughs> um, you're not going to want, or before my game, you're not going to want to do that. Um, causes insomnia. I always caution youth athletes, which means anyone under the age of 18, to completely avoid caffeine because of the dangers in young bodies. And I think that we've seen that in the media over the past year where there were two um, teenage people who died from caffeine intoxication in America um, by consuming what didn't really seem to be a huge amount of, of caffeine on the surface. So we need to be careful about how much caffeine we take in and um, realize that it's just a small amount of caffeine that seems to give us a boost. And any more is not helpful and can be really dangerous. Multivitamins. A lot of people ask, should I take a multivitamin? If you're following that Mediterranean um, eating style, you probably don't need a multivitamin because you're eating a huge variety of different foods. You're eating a rainbow of fruits and vegetables, lots of different colors, lots of variety different whole grains, all different food groups, um, and definitely including that, that other food group that gives you 10% of your daily iron needs. So that's good. Someone in my house always gives me a hard time that chocolate is a major food group. To me it is. So you probably don't need a multivitamin, but if you feel like you're training really hard and maybe your diet is suboptimal or you feel like you're just not eating as well as you usually do, then a regular um, multivitamin that, that includes about 100% of the, the total daily needs. You don't want to go more than about 100% of all the different vitamins and minerals. It's safe and um, may help if there's a nutrition or specific nutrient deficiency. Other than that, I recommend vitamin and mineral supplements on an individual basis. In this part of the world, a lot of us need a vitamin D supplement because we don't get enough sunlight throughout the year. So most of us sitting in this room are probably deficient in vitamin D. Um, some people need more iron than others. Um, and some people find that they have different you know, magnesium needs or that sort of thing. So I, I advise vitamins and minerals on, on an individual basis. Beetroot juice has gotten a lot of press in the past few years because um, beets happen to be a high nitrogen food and nitrogen has an effect on our blood vessels of relaxing smooth muscle tissue. So it relaxes the blood vessels which opens them up and allows more blood to flow to the muscles and so we're getting more oxygen to the muscles. So the research is still pretty um, preliminary without any really solid evidence. And some people are concerned about a high nitrogen content in the diet because maybe it increases some types of cancers. But um, I say if you like beets, then that's a great nutrition source and you're getting a little extra nitrogen there for your athletic performance. So definitely include those. Creatine has been around for a lot of years and a lot of athletes ask me about it. it tends to be used in athletes who have high intensity stop and go types of sports. It has been shown to be safe and effective for adults at the recommended dosage. There is no good research in youth athletes, so I caution all of my youth athletes to stay away from creatine because we really don't know if it's safe. So we come back to the bottom line. Um, no matter how many pills and potions are out there, and, and there are a lot, we do know from thousands and thousands and thousands of research studies that proper training, adequate rest, and a healthy diet are what, have, what give us the best edge and the best athletic performance. And those are the things that are controllable for us. So we want to look at our healthy sports diet in terms of giving us the best athletic performance, but also giving us lifelong health. Some resources to look at if you want 
to dig a little bit deeper and get some more specific information, I definitely recommend Nancy Clark's nutrition, Sports Nutrition Guidebook, and you can get it in any bookstore or on Amazon. It's a great, comprehensive, um, pretty thick book that tells you everything you wanted to know about um, sports nutrition. But all of these other um, organizations also have a lot of good sports nutrition information on the web. What questions can I address? First of all, I'm really impressed that you're all still awake. <laughs> this is really good. Aren't you tired? Yeah. 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 Can you say more about nuts, the different kinds of nuts, yeah. and what are good and what are, may not be so good? Okay. So what about nuts and the different types of nuts? What are good and what might not be so good? So all nuts in their natural form are good in different ways. They all seem to have a little different nutrient profile. The only nuts that I can think of that are not so good are the, the sugary ones where they add a lot of sugar on top of them, you know, like those honey peanuts and that sort of thing. But really, I mean, if you look at something like almonds, you don't get as much omega-3 fatty acids in almonds as you would say walnuts or pecans or macadamia nuts, but you get more calcium, So, and it's a great source of fiber, it's a good protein source. So what I do is um, I eat a variety of nuts. These are Brazil nuts, and in just six Brazil nuts in a in, if you eat just six Brazil nuts in a day, you've met your selenium needs for the whole day. So eat a variety of different nuts, walnuts, pecans, macadamia nuts, Brazil nuts, almonds. What am I missing? Peanuts. Peanuts. Yeah, they're all great choices. Um, so mix it up and, and have a serving of nuts every day if you can. Also seeds kind of fall into that category. These happen to be pumpkin seeds which are really rich in magnesium. And magnesium is one of those minerals that helps um, give you the best muscle function. Magnesium is used in muscle contraction, so a lot of us tend to be a little deficient in magnesium, so definitely include some pumpkin seeds in your morning breakfast or on your salad or however you like to do pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, um, any kind of seeds, chia seeds, yes. Um. If you, have a, if you have a nut allergy, what would be a substitute to get that protein? So um, sunflower seeds have a slightly different nutrient profile, but they're still a good choice. Um, so um, sun butter is just one brand that um, is very popular. What was the question? Oh, if you have a nut allergy, then how can you get close to that nutrient profile? But other seeds, like pumpkin seeds, again, can be ground up into to make a, a sort of kind of a nut butter out of those. Yes. So the craze are smoothies these days. Yes. Right? And so lots of sugar with the fruits and everything else that's in it. Your thoughts on a daily smoothie yeah. plus minus? That's a great question. What about smoothies? It's all the craze today. I caution a lot of my clients about smoothies because they're loaded with calories and natural sugars. And some have even added sugars. Like if you buy a, a prepackaged smoothie, quite often it has sugar added to it that you really don't need. So if you can tolerate a smoothie right around your athletic performance time, that's a great time to get all that, that sugar into your body to help improve your athletic performance or right after a, tr a training or a, a race or a game is a good time to have your smoothie. But um, I think it's best to consider what's going into your smoothie. And if you find that it's just too many calories for you, then cut back on the portion size and replace some of the fruit in the smoothie with vegetables. Greens like spinach and carrots um, are two things that are really easy to throw into a smoothie. Celery is another thing that goes really well in a smoothie. So replace some of the fruit with, with some vegetables if you want to cut down on the calories and the natural um, sugars. Yes? So like with the, the omega-3s of fish, I mean, are, are all 
are all fish created equal, or no. are higher on the predatory standpoint, or yeah. what's a better fish than another? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, definitely the fish that are, are more fatty fish are going to give us more of those omega-3 fatty acids. Tuna, mackerel, herring, sardines. So it doesn't necessarily mean big fish, but it, it's the oily fish. Some fish have more oils. But even the non-fatty fish, like the white fish, cod and haddock, um, pollock, they're, they're still good choices and still are going to have some omega-3s, but not as much as salmon and tuna and sardines, herring. Yeah. 